I've never been in a meeting where the first question is, how much money can we make from this? Right. It's the, the question. The first question is always, what is the big, hairy customer problem that we're solving? So AWS, how closely integrated is AWS into Amazon, into the mothership? Oh, really good question. I, um, and and it, again, with this this culture theme keeps coming through. You know, the, one of the reasons that Amazon has been able to sort of grow as aggressively and successfully as it has is because it has such a strong culture. I mean, you know, anybody who's done sort of any research at all on Amazon knows about sort of the leadership principles, which are, yeah. you know, when I joined 14 and now 16 of our leadership principles uh, and you know, I've experienced lots of companies where the leadership principles are, you know, great fodder for posters on the wall or mouse pads if they still exist or, you know, uh, or coasters or whatever. It, at Amazon, these things are real and people genuinely live by them. Um, and it's what uh, it's what's enabled the company kind of to grow and still maintain its uh, its consistency. It's of culture. Um, and AWS is very much a part of it. I mean, the genesis of AWS was, you know, Amazon's philosophy has always been, if we're going to build something, let's build it in a way that it can be platformized. It can be productized for other, people's to con other people to consume from. And so, you know, what started on the Amazon.com side with, hey, let's let third party sellers, you know, uh, use our platform because we're never going to be able to satisfy all the demand that's out there was very much the that that's what the germination for AWS, where Andy Jassy, who, you know, uh, 17 years ago founded AWS is now the CEO of yeah. all Amazon.com came along yeah. and said, you know what we can do? We've built this underlying tech platform that supports Amazon.com. Let's take that and productize it and let other people um, benefit from, you know, our learnings and our scale uh, as well. Now, as a result, and especially with Andy now in charge of it, you know, AWS is not only technically, you know, an intrinsic part to what Amazon.com is doing because it all runs on top of AWS. But then culturally, you know, it's never, it's never been considered separate. It's a, it's a business unit, but everything we do there is, mm. is run, uh, is run the same way. Oh, okay. So in terms of technology innovation, then obviously, I mean, AWS is synonymous with cloud computing. Now in terms of tech innovation, how much do AWS influence Amazon's innovation around around any sort of software and technology. Yeah. One of the things that I think differentiates Amazon from any place I've ever worked. Uh, by the way, the, the most striking, immediately obvious thing that, that makes Amazon feel different than other, country, other companies is that um, uh, it's all document writing at Amazon. So, uh, you know, uh, I haven't used a PowerPoint except to launch it for stuff that people have sent me from outside. Uh, since I started working here, like I haven't made a single PowerPoint presentation since I got here. It's all document based. Um, wow. And it's a very trippy experience. Your first handful of meetings when you come here and you're accustomed to sitting down around a table and somebody puts up a PowerPoint presentation and starts going through slides and speaking to them and and uh, kind of you sit there and you receive and then there's an interaction, you know, in when you walk into a meeting at Amazon, invariably there's uh, either a piece of paper a stack of papers or a document that somebody shared digitally. And the first quarter of the meeting, whether it's a half hour, two hours, six hour meeting is yeah. just spent reading. It's silent. I've um, heard this. I've heard this actually. Yeah. I think it's genius because then nobody in that meeting has got any excuse. You know what I mean? It's like, even if they haven't read the stuff they should have read, they can read it now. So therefore everyone's on the same page. That's, that's, that's fantastic that they, they've rolled and, that and out. Gareth, yeah. And two, two, Two additional really important points with this, and this is why I don't think I'll ever go back to PowerPoint culture that um, hopefully I retire from AWS. But if that doesn't happen and I join other companies, um, I'm not sure I could ever go back to PowerPoint because the thing that it enables, it, it, it very much kind of levels the playing field in that, you know, when you're walking through a PowerPoint presentation, the person who's created the presentation already knows what's coming next, but nobody else does. And so it's sort of this nonlinear process, whereas in the doc writing culture, everybody consumes what's on the page and has the full story to then be able to ask questions about instead of just bits and pieces along the way. Um, 
and so it very much kind of democratizes on one level. Mm. Uh, the second is it's very sort of standard practice that the most senior person in the room goes last. And so when we would do doc reads with Jeff and now Andy, um, you know, they always go last because they don't want their questions or their directions to kind of influence, you know, the other people in the room. And so yeah. there's this kind of unspoken but natural hierarchy of, sure. of feedback that you get. It's super valuable. Um, That's in any it. event, uh, I'm, I'm digressing way far away from from the question that you asked, which is AWS doesn't really influence how Amazon.com works. A mm. AWS really enables Amazon.com to do what it needs to do. And this gets to uh, a very important tenet at Amazon, which is working back from customers, right? Yeah, another yeah, sure. way, another thing that's been sort of shocking and it's very different about working here is I've never been in a meeting where the first question is, how much money can we make from this? Right. It's the, the question. The first question is always, what is the big, hairy customer problem that we're solving? And the presumption yeah, sure. being that, look, if we really focus on customer requirements and we build the things that solve the biggest, most challenging customer problems, you know, the money will subsequently follow. So it's yeah, really sure. about working back from customers and solving customer problems, not, you know, and so in the case of Amazon and AWS, we're not telling AW, Amazon what to do. To the contrary, they're telling us what their requirements are. We're, we're building uh, technologies and services that support not just them, but also, you know, the, the rest of our AWS customer base. And, you know, just as everybody else benefits from the work that we do for Amazon.com, you know, Amazon.com benefits from the work that we're doing for everybody else as well. And, you know, we... We consider Amazon.com the same in the same light and with the same gravity that we would any one of our other any one of our other customers. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's really, really, really interesting stuff. I mean, it, it kind of feels like a little bit of a given now that you you obsess about the customer and work back from that point. But I can recall, you know, Amazon just just working in that way, or even just articulating it in that way, um, was quite it was, I would call it revolutionary. I think, I don't think anyone really had thought about it like that. Do you know what I mean? It was always about the profit and the bot, top line, bottom line. It was never about, you know, most companies thought of it in that way. And, and it was a bit of a paradigm shift, I would say. A hundred percent. And and this is where, you know, and, and this predates me by a significant margin, but, you know, that, that DNA that Jeff sort of set very early on, and you'll remember when, you know, Amazon.com went public and, you know, Jeff's first uh, shareholder letter is uh, one of the artifacts that everybody who comes into Amazon uh, reads because he very much sets the tone, you know, that had not successfully been set previously in the public markets, which is, look, we're in this for long term growth and we're willing to trade sort of short term profitability and quarter to quarter focus to think about, you know, years, decades Um and the payoff will come and, you know, uh, it's, it's proven out over and over and over again. Uh, and so it, it was revolutionary and I think it's, it's, um, but, but again, you know, um, I don't want to sound too judgmental. I don't think there are lots of right ways to do things. Yeah, um, sure. This is the way that really has worked for Amazon, um, and has kept, uh, you know, has kept the culture so strong since sort yeah. of he set that DNA, you know, decades ago. How do you see AWS evolving over the next five years in terms of the, the product offering? That is a big question. I think, you know, again, in a universe where you're a $90 billion company and you see your addressable market as three to $4 trillion, um, there is, you know, expansion that will be happening on, you know, a number of different, very large dimensions. Um, you know, what we will continue to do, you know, is, you know, offer the broadest and deepest array of services uh, that, you know, customers can access in the cloud, um, you know, and what that's across the entirety of the stack. So whether it's the, you know, at the bottom of the stack, or if you're thinking about, you know, our compute and storage uh, services, you know, everything from, you know, new storage types that make uh, that make data more affordably and more uh, and more accessible. 
Mm. Um, whether you're talking about compute instances that are uh, continue to push, you know, like we do with our Graviton instances, which are, you know, custom silicon that we build that really pushes the limits of kind of price performance um, of all of our services to, uh, we talk about generative AI and AI, you know, we have, uh, you know, evolving our compute um, instances in that direction. So things like uh, our inferentia chips, which, you know, are optimized price performance for doing inference with your AI models or oh, wow, Trainium, okay. which is optimized for, for doing training for your models. You know, so at that level of the stack, there's a number of different dimensions that are going to be, be uh, where we're going to see innovation in the next five years or so, um, you know, a layer up from there, you talk about sort of our database and analytics layer and, you know, a lot of interesting stuff that's happening across, you know, in databases and our analytics products where you have sort of zero ETL products, which sort of accelerate the ability for customers to, uh, to do their, um, to run their workloads, uh, a ton of opportunity there. Um, and then sort of at the, up at the application layer, and this is where, you know, when we think about Gen AI, we think about all of these layers, but, yeah. um, you know, just increased productivity application development, whether it's, you know, our collection of kind of connect call center tools or our end user applications like workspaces. Um, it's, you know, there's just, it, there are a lot of different directions. And obviously I, I suspect we'll segue to, to Gen AI as a really <laughs> key driver, not just sure. in the short term, but, but, you know, over the next decades. Thank you.